Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. He's been working very hard, very diligently on this passionate project of his. I think since I met him at CPAC in 2010 or 11, he was talking about it then. I'm not sure if he was actually going and recording the interviews. I think he's flown all over the world to do the interviews. He's a writer and director at Let Us Disagree Productions, a libertarian, uh, and he's a documentarian filmmaker of his newest film which was just released the housing bubble and he has another film coming out too the second part of it in the near future jimmy morrison thank you for joining me again hey thanks for having me on Uh, i really appreciate it it's been like four years since we last talked so i'm glad to catch up yes and i gotta give you credit man you didn't you didn't give up like uh, we don't want to go into the details here on the recording but you've had a lot to overcome getting this film you know into finally finalized so people can actually see it and it's, it's really starting to turn heads. So what, why did you want to make this film? So I actually started a house painting business in 2006, literally the month that house prices peaked. So it was pretty terrible timing. And uh, I dropped out of college to pursue film and was just, uh, just planning on using the house painting business as like a way to fund my film projects. So like as an entrepreneur, I didn't want to make the same mistake twice. And, you know, as I had, uh, I graduated from high school in 2005. So I had, you know, I was a little young when the dot-com bubble burst, but for the housing bubble, I just kind of got to watch it firsthand and see how the market was affected. Um, And so I was painting a house and I had just done a a search for economics uh, in a a torrent search and found the free audio book from the Mises Institute, uh, Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And uh, basically, I was painting a house, listening to him explain how the housing crash was going to unfold, and he wrote that in the 1940s. And so that gave me the idea uh, to make a documentary where I interview people who predicted the crash, ask them why it happened, what's next. Um, and, you know, it started as just like an academic project, that, you know, although I wanted it to be accessible to people, like in reality, I made like a very academic uh, film. Um, and so that's really what's taken us so long is, uh, it's grown into this much bigger thing where I have a whole production team and, um, you know, we have two whole films and we really get into a lot of these issues, uh, in a way that's accessible to people where we use like the daily show and like South Park and, you know, all these cartoons to really make all these ideas accessible to the common person. And we really don't use economics terms at all. Like it's, it's just a, a layman's movie where we look at the financial crisis from the perspective of the people that actually predicted the crash. Yeah, Economics in One Lesson is actually one of my favorite books by Henry Hazlitt, so it's a really easy read. It's actually one of the best books, besides Peter Schiff and Erwin Schiff. I believe Peter just uh, reissued his dad's book. He updated a little bit, put better pictures in there. He has a similar beginner's book for economics as well. But those are some of the basic beginner's books to learn real economics, you know, not the garbage that people are taught at universities, the Keynesian and all the other the other theories so for the documentary it's the the first film as you said around 78 minutes long which people did you interview for the the first film well we got a a range of like economists and like financial writers and also people that have been really successful in finance um jim rogers is probably uh financially the most successful person we interviewed uh his first 10 years as an investor the stock market went up 50 percent and his portfolio went up 4,200 percent. I know you've had him on your show. Um, But we also interviewed uh, Mark Faber, Doug Casey, Peter Schiff, Ron Paul, uh, David Stockman. Uh, Peter Wallison was the lone dissenting member of Congress's uh, commission on the financial crash. He was the only one that had a a differing view on what actually happened. And they only let him talk for less than 10 minutes. So they've spent, you know, all this money on this commission and then never even really uh, talk to the guy that said maybe the mainstream story isn't exactly what happened. Um, and also they passed like Dodd-Frank before they even got the commission's results. So clearly they didn't care. Um, and it was just a, a publicity stunt. Um, but he's in the film. And then we also interviewed a bunch of economists like uh, Robert Murphy, Mark Thornton, Roger Garrison, Jeffrey Herbener, Joseph Salerno. Um, and then Tom Woods actually co-wrote the project with me. So he opened up so many doors and got all these you know, helped me get all these interviews. Um, and then he really helped me uh, write this thing and rewrite it until uh, we could get it where it was accessible to people. And so I'm, I'm so excited that people can actually watch it now. We premiered a couple of weeks ago at Freedom Fest at the Anthem Film Festival. 
Um, and, uh, we, you know, we had such great support there. And then the following week, we went to the Mises Institute and did a screening during Mises University. And, uh, people are just really excited about it and, uh, things are growing. So if people do want to check out the bubble um, they can actually watch the film right now online by joining our street team. Uh, the movie comes out in October. The first movie does, so you can pre-order that. Um, but if you pay an extra 15 bucks, you can join our street team. And uh, as long as you commit to watching the film with a friend or, you know, anybody, it doesn't have to be a friend. Um, but basically, like, agreeing to try to get the word out there with this movie. Um, for just 15 bucks more, you can join the street team and be able to watch the movie now instead of having to wait till October when it comes out. Yeah, there's a lot of libertarians here in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Maybe you'll set up a screening. Um, there's a number of organizations around here that could potentially do that, so maybe you'll set that up. The film has already won some awards, right? Yeah, uh, so in October, we're planning on doing our New York City premiere. It's actually the 10th anniversary of the bailout uh, and the crash, so it's kind of amazing that we've gone this, this long, but um, we're planning on doing a screening in the D.C. area around the same time. Um, and, you know, Virginia and Pennsylvania, uh, just do some screenings out there. We've done a lot of test screenings. Uh, when I first started the project, you know, I didn't want to show it to people because it, I knew it wasn't ready. Um, but eventually I realized, like, to understand uh, what the common man thinks of it, I have to go show it to people that haven't had, uh, you know, haven't been spending all these years making it where your head's been in that space for so long. So uh, our test screenings really helped us. Uh, shape it into something that anybody can understand uh, as opposed to somebody that's been studying economics for a while uh, is going to get it. Yeah, I have to give you props on that because I'm I'm only 13 minutes into the the first film so far, so I'm not all the way done, but I'm very impressed with all the video clips in there. I think you did a great job covering all the basics extremely, extremely well. This is not for very sophisticated financial professionals. This is actually entertaining enough where my mom and dad might actually be interested in this. Yeah, and we don't just uh, gloss over everything. It's still packed with information. So the first movie, uh, the first half of the first movie uh, covers um, the run-up of the housing bubble and what causes bubbles and you know how we, what our claims are about how this housing bubble uh, took place. And then the second half of the first movie, we go back and apply those claims to other crashes like the Great Depression and the Panic of 1920. We talk about going off the gold standard and the stagflation of the 1970s. And, you know, we bring it all the way back up to today. And so people get to see, like, not only uh, are these claims ringing true from this crash and did people from the Austrian School of Economics predict this crash, but all these other crashes throughout the last century – you know, they've never claimed to be able to predict the timing of them, but they've been able to predict what these distortions are uh, that happen when we create a bunch of money. And so I think even if, you know, you already know a lot about this stuff, you're still going to really be interested in the movie because um, it's just packed full uh, with information from all those time periods. And it was also entertaining because there's a lot of pop culture references in there about money. So it's it's very entertaining from that standpoint. This is not like just one guy talking for 45 minutes like on my, my my normal interviews are for a certain type of audience. But I would say this your film is more for a general audience where it's actually entertaining because it's mixed in a lot of pop culture reference references as well. Yeah, and I think that makes it a lot easier for people to swallow and they're a lot more uh, likely to to go along with us if they're. Uh, seeing people like John Stewart point out these things where that's really a, he was a prime source of news for a big uh, chunk of the population for quite a while. And uh, I think people, um, when it, when it comes to bringing cultural stuff into it, they're going to just be so much more receptive. Like if you see uh, a clip from Animaniacs or something or from South Park that uh, makes the same points we're making, like it really backs things up. And that's funny about John Stewart because, like, there's actually a long story about this where he interviewed uh, him or one of his uh, lower level journalists, and I'm using air quotes here, interviewed Peter Schiff for like six hours, and then they edited him down to like a 15. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. Yeah, they got him on the the minimum wage because he said that mentally handicapped people um, would make less uh, than a minimum wage, and so everybody just, you know, they pulled the clip out and made him sound ridiculous, but like. I mean, that's true. Even like with our current laws with the minimum wage, like there's a lower minimum wage for mentally handicapped people because otherwise they wouldn't be employable. 
And for example, in Iowa, they have uh, can deposits, uh, but the distributor has set it up so they get the money at the beginning of the can deposit. So like the grocery store pays the five cents to them. And so it goes all the way down the line where you pay the grocery store. So everybody's just getting their five cents back. Um, and then at the very end, it would have to be sorted and go back to the original distributor because they were the ones that lobbied and set it up that way. They basically got a free loan that way uh, over that time period. So it seems to me that the mainstream media really wants us to forget mainstream media, mainstream financial media wants us to forget about the 2008 financial crisis. Like, you know, it was just a blip in the road. The bull market in stocks is back. Uh, you're a moron if you don't buy Facebook on this dip or uh, any of these other FANG stocks or technology stocks that have taken a dip and pay 85 times earnings, etc. So that's kind of the mindset. I, I, when I, when I do rarely watch the mainstream financial media, Jimmy, it seems like they don't even want to talk about why 2008 was caused, what happened. They don't want to even remember it. Right. It's going to be really interesting to see uh, on the 10th anniversary how they cover uh, looking back on this stuff. I'm sure they'll just gloss over it or not even mention it. Um, but, I mean, that part of that is just because there have been so many distortions in the last 10 years. I mean, they really did create an insane amount of money. Um, in 2003, they just pushed interest rates down to like 1%. Uh, for a year, and they did that by creating a billion dollars a day. Uh, but they did it on a much wider scale this time, and it wasn't just them doing it. It was uh, global. All the other central banks were just printing insane amounts of money at the same time. And so our interest rates had been pushed all the way down to essentially zero for, you know, almost eight years, ten years. Like, this is just insane. Like, it has to uh, cause distortions. Like, uh, the interest rate is a price, and if you just – artificially manipulate a price, people are going to think that they're wealthier than they actually uh, are. And uh, I think that's what we're seeing is not just in like the media coverage, but um, what's happening for people that get this money or that are well connected to the industries that the government favors where they, they divert uh, this money. Well, if, if the mainstream media does cover the 10th anniversary of the bailouts, like you said, I think, unfortunately, it'll be like some type of... Uh, like hero honoring ceremony for Ben Bernanke because remember according to Time magazine he was the hero of the year he saved us all from the abyss right despite the fact that his promises of his exit strategy never came to fruition and he just you know retired before he'd have to deal with the problem and here we are 10 years later yeah they've tapered and then now they're uh, going to start selling these in the market. But uh, what they've promised that they would sell and what they've actually sold has been uh, a, a huge discrepancy. And, you know, going forward, uh, I, you know, how are they going to dump all these mortgage-backed securities on the market or these treasury securities on the market? Like, yes, there's going to be money coming in from other countries. And uh, one thing that you ta you've talked about a lot on your show is, um, you know, if, if things are doing bad in Europe, people are going to send some of that money this way to, to as kind of a, a safe haven. But, you know, they can't just dump all, all this debt onto the market at a time when we're facing a deficit over a trillion dollars. Um, there's just no way that all that money is just going to get sucked up by the market and everything's going to be okay. So it's only a matter of time. They're just kicking the can down the road. And whether it's this crash or the next crash, uh, eventually people are going to start to see, hey, like their story isn't making sense. Like, you know, first it was Fannie Mae, uh, and I can see how people were able to miss that. You know, they thought oh, the banks were just being greedy. But now when they're going to start seeing it in other industries like Sally Mae and, you know, they had to bail out the uh, car uh, industry through executive order last time, like, if they have to bail out the car companies again, you know, at some point people are going to start to turn and see that, you know, maybe maybe it's the government we should be pointing our finger at and not just the people that are getting caught up in these manipulated booms. Yeah, so we, we don't have cap, real capitalism anymore because the government isn't allowing a lot of these large corporations to fail. But if I could add to your points there about the money coming in, I mean, really, the rules have changed a lot since 2008. After Lehman Brothers failed, I think a lot of the central banks and governments just decided, you know what, we're going to print as much as we can. We're going to delay the next crisis rather than uh, making allowing the free market to work and the crash being 
uh, prolonged and larger and a true you know real deflation and cleansing they printed things to try to create an illusion of a recovery and delay the next crash as long as possible well i think they've just made things worse so they, they they've just definitely in my opinion they've just definitely made things worse a lot of the problems that were there prior to 2008 have not been fixed and now they're larger so you have old bubbles that were either reflated now basically look at housing prices i don't know if you covered this i'm only 13 minutes in in the in the first documentary but you know housing prices in a lot of cities in the united states jimmy are back to 2006 levels if not higher in some cases now maybe that's not all the federal reserves blame maybe that's because the european money is coming into the united states the chinese money is coming into the united states and canada and australia etc as well yeah i think that's absolutely the case um i i think that uh it it's completely unsustainable for us to rely on that and if for example, China, you know, faces a huge crash. Um, you know, that, that's surely going to have uh, uh, an influence on us since we just rely on us printing a bunch of money and sending it over there and them sending us all the stuff they're making. So uh, I think they're in a much uh, better place in the long run as far as, like, population and stuff like that. Um, but there's definitely going to be problems over there and we're going to be affected by that because we've kind of been propped up uh, by that. And also, although our price inflation has been relatively low here um, compared to some other places, uh, a lot of our inflation has been exported to Asia and they've had to deal with the higher prices um, as the money's flowed over there. So um, there's all sorts of problems. I do think that like Ben Bernanke thought he was going to make things uh, easier next time like he thought if we just print up all this money and give it to these banks then they won't be insolvent anymore because their balance sheets will say they have all this money but then we can just pay them which they would never done before but then they just started paying them uh to keep extra money there at the fed um and that all the while they're going out and saying hey we're trying to get these banks to lend they're just not lending but really they just wanted to make them look solvent uh, and they thought, you know, maybe there will be a crash down the road, but when it happens, at least they'll, they'll look solvent. But I don't think people are going to fall for that. And it really doesn't matter because, you know, back then the banks were just relying on like overnight cheap money and like Lehman Brothers needed like a billion dollars a day. And since they couldn't get that money, uh, they had to go bankrupt. Um, but I think things are much worse. And the banks are even much more reliant on the lower interest rates and just cheap money being handed out. And I, th I think China has gotten into that Keynesian trap where they've been doing a lot of central planning and they've gotten an enormous credit bubble there now the last 10 years. So I'm not sure exactly how it's going to work out. If you talk with a lot of people in the comment section of my videos, they'll tell me China's fine. They'll just devalue their currency and there'll be no problems. <laughs> I, I, I literally yeah. have seen comments like that. Yeah, China will be fine. They'll just devalue their currency. Everything will be fine. Nothing will collapse. Right. Well, and people seem to forget that the last time we tried that, it was the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. So, yeah, we were able to paper over the problem temporarily, but we didn't solve anything. And now there's even more debt that we have to deal with. And that's kind of the big distinction. People look at, like, the housing bubble and they're like, oh, well, we gave them, you know, cheap houses or free houses or, like, subsidized houses, essentially, by pouring all this money into the industry. But in reality, they just jack the prices up. And then to avoid the crash, they try to keep propping them up, making them unaffordable for people. And so what they, they didn't give people houses, they gave them debt. And the same is true with education. They didn't give people an education, they just gave them debt. So I think uh, with the internet and with uh, all these alternative ways of people learning about what's going on, like podcasts and, you know, you do an incredible job of interviewing all these people, you know, that didn't exist for people. And now when people are working, uh, or when they're driving or doing whatever, going jogging, they're able to get an education on their own, and it's directed by the best economists they can find or the best people in their field they can find just talking about their industries. Whereas before, you know, for schooling, you had to just rely on whatever teacher was down the road, um, which, you know, it's easy to see uh, how much more uh, effective uh, education can be uh, in a model like that going forward. So obviously there's things you have to do hands-on, but I think technology is just making uh, those alternative forms of hands-on education even more uh, viable going into the future. So 
you know, in the long run, I think education is really the way out of this. And that's why we tried to make a documentary that can help educate people. Yeah, I'm a big proponent of financial education. I actually have a business plan for a full educational technology company where people can learn a very comprehensive and affordable financial education from experts and stuff with virtual classrooms. Fortunately, no one, no one serious business partner has been interested in helping me get a fund. I had a couple deals that almost went through in the last couple of years. They just didn't work out. But you brought up an interesting point about, you know, other countries getting the exported inflation. You know, now I think with President Trump and these tariffs and trade wars, you can go back and look through history history and all these central banks the five or six main ones with their quantitative easing or whatever the hell you want to call their their money creation or credit creation plans they've put combined with these potential tariffs they're putting a lot of higher costs and inflation into the global supply chain and the other so that's going to lead at some point to a lot worse stagflation i think that's the best case scenario the thing about china like you said i i think china the best case scenario is japan so you talked about the U.S. printing money. Well, Japan's also been printing a lot of money. The U.S. may end up in s similar circumstances to Japan, where it's a very expensive city, and yet to live in all the cities in Japan, and yet they claim that they have deflation all the time. So I think like China with their misallocation trillions and misallocation of capital and their credit bubbles, that you know they may be facing a, a Japan-type scenario. But a lot of that monetary inflation, Jimmy, I think it's... It hasn't really gone into the real economy yet. We do have inflation, but not the levels that a lot of the Austrians were predicting because there was Austria right. predicting hyperinflation. Now, there's an argument to be made, though, that these asset prices, the stocks, the bonds, the real estate, people you're in my age, you know, who normally in the past, uh, people our age, we would have gotten married, started a family, bought a house, right? But people in our age demographic are delaying these things because honestly, they're really in a lot of instances, they can't afford them. Yeah, and we in both films we actually address the idea that you know uh, if there's no price in, or inflation, like if they are able to keep prices relatively stable, uh, you know, monetarists and some other people believe that's just going to uh, make a crash impossible. But what we show is that no, like you said, it's asset prices. People are still being distorted. People are still making uh, different decisions than they would have otherwise if the interest rate wasn't manipulated down. So people are spending more. They're saving less. Um, they're, if uh, something's affected by interest rates more, like housing, where it's a long-term loan that's going to have uh, more and more interest if the interest rates are higher, uh, people are making different decisions when they just manipulate these prices. So regardless of whether prices uh, have gone up, uh, they're still higher than they otherwise would be. And all these distortions and problems are still being created. Exactly, exactly. And the mainstream financial media is pumping this new technology stock bubble and the stock market bubble. There, are, There's talking heads every day, almost every minute of every day on the financial television, business financial television channels, arguing that, you know, with Facebook bombing earnings, that is it time to buy Facebook? Are we going to buy it up now? Is it time to buy some of these other FANG technology stocks that have dropped? I mean, look at the valuations. I'm not predicting an imminent stock market crash because I think, you know, in the environment we're in where the governments and central banks can change the rules, that trying to say that everything's going to crash a month or two from now is a fool's errand. You just can't do it. You just can't do it. You, right. gotta, you have to see something big break first. Like there has to be like a Lehman Brothers or AIG moment, maybe like a European bank, a big one is allowed to fail or a couple emerging market countries maybe default on their debt because the dollar got too strong. We'd have to see evidence of those things first before we know that things that, that the people in power, the, the economic and political elites are actually, you know, despite their best efforts, things are actually uh, cracking. Yeah, and I, I also think going back, uh, it's important, important to note that there were some people that uh, did get some predictions right on the upside, that they weren't just perma bears. Like Mark Faber predicted the bottom in the stock market in 2009, like to the week. And, uh, you know, there are others out there. Um, but uh, going forward, I think um, – so let's talk. Let's talk about the second. I've interviewed Mark Faber a lot. Uh, I think he's smart. Uh, the mainstream media, mainstream financial media, just relentlessly makes fun of him, and they don't even bring up his correct market call, like you said. It's it's totally unfair the way he's been treated for for years now. 
Yeah, and even Peter Schiff, although he's been wrong on some things, and, uh, you know, the longer the boom go- goes on, the less money he's going to make, obviously, uh, in the short term. Um, but he, he said all along that some of this money is going to pour into stocks. And so it's not like they're just saying uh, there's only busts. They're just saying that this is going to create a serial bubble economy where there's booms and busts. And if they try to just print their way uh, out during the bust, it's going to delay uh, their correction and um, prolong it. And when they do things like Trump's been doing with like tariffs and stuff, uh, as we saw in the Great Depression, you know, that was a horrible mistake and it, it definitely prolonged the depression and uh, created a lot of problems. So who, who knows when the crash will actually come, um, but at least we can uh, be prepared so that we're not completely just caught up in the mania. Yeah, and I would I would say we're there. Uh, there's an argument to be made that we're the asset prices have definitely been hyperinflated. So I think there's there's an argument to be made when you look at valuations, whether it's home prices in a lot of major cities in different countries, Australia, Canada, different cities in the United States. There's an argument to be made for there the bond market, bull market that's gone on for so long, with governments manipulating interest rates down to so they can borrow cheaper. Basically, the U.S.'s borrowing costs have not exploded even though the amount of money they're borrowing is more because they manipulated interest rates down since the 2008 financial crisis with financial oppression. Although now rates are being raised, I don't think we're going to see them normalize. And probably during the next financial crisis, they're going to be lowered again. So it's, yeah, it's just, I mean, they can't, they can't really afford for them to go up that much because the interest on the debt would be insane. If the government had to actually pay a normal interest rate, uh, it, it would be insurmountable for the budget. And with all the unfunded liabilities that they're facing, there's just no way that they'll be able to do it. So, you know, on a long-term prospectus, uh, the United States is the uh, biggest debtor nation in the history of the world. And uh, over in Asia, China is the biggest creditor nation. So um, long-term, it, it's, it's hard to see how the United States can be sustainable going forward. So preview the second movie that you have coming out. It's going to touch on some of the topics we've just spent the last 10 or 15 minutes talking about. Then it's going to talk about the global macro picture, maybe how the everything bubble has expanded and how it's not just the U.S. who's involved in these crazy money and credit creation schemes. Yeah, right. And we go through the bail. So the second film starts with the bailouts in 2008 and brings it up to today. So people don't want the history lesson. And, you know, they say, oh, the housing bubble doesn't affect me now. I don't care about that stuff. They'll be able to just watch the second movie. Um, But, yeah, we go through all that stuff. We start with the bailouts and the stimulus. And one thing that's interesting about uh, the Fed's response and how they, you know, bailed out all these banks and uh, gave them all these uh, loans of just money that they created out of thin air um, they, the whole time they're lying about it. Like everybody was, uh, in an outcry over the amount of money they were doing, but we found out later they were actually doing trillions and trillions of dollars more. And it was done in secret and they were bailing out federal cent- or foreign central banks and they were bailing out, uh, fe- uh, foreign banks as well. So, uh, it, it's foreign really something where yeah. we have no, yeah, we have no idea what all they're doing. And, um, so going forward, like I said before, you know, industries are affected by interest rates um, and that the government is diverting resources into are ones that are affected by this stuff. Um, and so car loans is one industry where we've seen used car prices come down a little bit, um, but we'll, we'll see how long that keeps going. But uh, really, like with the amount of money that they've created, there's a reason they call it the everything bubble, because assets are skyrocketing. Um, and at some point that won't continue because this has already been, uh, one of the longest boom cycles, uh, we've ever seen. So the, at some point something's got to drop, but, um, yeah, the, the second film, uh, we really, for example, on like uh, Bitcoin or gold, uh, our film isn't making a determination on something like that. We're more trying to show, uh, what, what the causes of these serial bubbles are, um, so that people have the tools to be able to to, to prepare themselves uh, and make their own decisions on what kind of ways they can protect themselves moving forward. Because um, that's kind of one thing I've learned from this project is I've really been humbled by it, that, you know, these guys aren't saying they have all the answers. They aren't saying they, they can time these things or know when they crash or when the boom is going to come. Uh, they're just saying that these distortions 
are inevitable when you have the government manipulating prices in the way that they have and that they have outcomes. You know, it was easy to see that uh, after Trump did tariffs that eventually we were going to have to bail out the farmers in response. And it's easy to see that the steel tariffs are going to fail because George Bush did the same thing uh, 15 years ago and they had to roll those back. So um, there, there, there are patterns we can find, but at the same time, uh, in a time like we've had in the last 10 years where things have been so manipulated um, and, uh, you know, housing and banking are like some of the most regulated industries uh, in the country. Um, but that didn't prevent any of this stuff. You know, the regulations were rewarding banks for getting into mortgage-backed securities. Uh, they viewed them as less safe. So, and, um, and if you saw the movie The Big Short and you read the book and you've talked around with some of the regulators, you know the regulators aren't policing the banks and the large corporations so hard. A lot of them, even though they have pretty cushy jobs, many of them here in the Washington, D.C. metro, they want a higher-paying job and they want to go work for the corporation. So they're not going to be, in a lot of cases, unfortunately – too hard on the corporations that they're supposed to be strict, strictly regulating. Yeah, and, absolutely. It's you know, there's no way that system is going to work. And I, I was going to actually ask you what did you learn from the people you have interviewed, but you actually answered it in the last couple of minutes. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so thanks. So, so thanks for. Oh, well, I'll, tell, I'll, hmm? I'll, I'll tell you another one. Uh, Doug Casey. I asked him about the Community Reinvestment Act, uh, and he told me, Jimmy, I don't get caught up in the details or any of that shit and i think that was great advice because like it really doesn't benefit you to know every time the government does something wrong like you should just focus on like learning the stuff that you can use to uh be helpful to other people like there's no sense just dwelling on it just the fact that you know that some guy got shot by a cop isn't going to benefit anything you know what i mean so that's that's another thing that i kind of learned from one of them doug casey also told me that uh, when you travel, uh, you suddenly have the the word American at the front of whatever you do. So if you're an economist or a filmmaker, uh, you're going to be able to open a lot more doors because you can say, hey, I'm an uh, American filmmaker. And so uh, I, you mentioned me traveling a little bit. I went over to Europe um, d and did events uh, at, at the Warsaw School of Economics with the Mises Institute of Poland, with the Lithuania Free Market Institute in Vilnius, Lithuania, and then with the Mises Institute of Estonia. Uh, in Tallinn. And while I was in Estonia, uh, after hearing Doug Case's advice, uh, I just contacted uh, their government and I was able to interview their finance minister, their prime minister, their social minister, uh, all because I just asked, you know, and because I was an American filmmaker, they said yes. So I think uh, traveling is something that's very important, not just for like, because you can open doors, but because when you're exposed to other cultures, uh, that's the best way to learn and be educated. And so many of the people I interviewed are just so well traveled. That's all essentially all they do is they just go around and go to like Africa and South America and uh, try to learn about these places on the ground instead of just relying on what people are saying on TV. Yeah, I agree. CNN is not going to give you all the answers you need <laughs> on foreign policy. Right. <laughs> Right. Although Dave Smith is on uh, CNN, he's a, a stand-up comedian who was at our Mises University screening last week. So uh, well, they do have they do have one good him. guy on there. Yeah, no I kidding. Wonder. Especially especially as a stand-up comedian, you know, he, he says one thing and he he could be axed. Hopefully, okay. they don't watch his Mises University speech. I'm sure, like David Brock's, like Media Matters people are probably going to work on getting him fired very shortly. <laughs> unfortunately i wish i was wrong about that but um, this is a new normal we're in now like i was telling you before we started recording about the stuff that a, sh a short seller who did research was trying to be honest with his work and you know people are just attacking him harassing him suing him just for you know trying to put his opinion out there he's not um you know he's i i honestly think he 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 had good intentions but you know in the new normal now if someone disagrees with you, someone could go after your job. Someone could sue you. It's really, it's it's gotten really sad at this point. But I, I really want to, I'm so proud of you, Jimmy. Finally getting to the finish line here. It was not easy. But you, you've worked how many years on this project? So I first uh, pitched the project to Tom Woods in October 2010. Started shooting interviews in May of 2011. Um, but yeah, it's been a long process. Uh, it was interesting. Mark Thornton uh, was on our panel uh, at Mises University, and he he said that uh, well, he predicted the crash uh, in 2004. He was writing articles about the bubble in housing, 
Um, and he said he was interviewed for 15 different documentaries over the years. And uh, the housing bubble that we're releasing is the first one, uh, if not the only one, to come out. So uh, uh, it's been a hard battle, but uh, I was, I'm glad to have finally failed long enough that I was able to succeed and get it out to people. And uh, I'm just so excited to hear feedback from people. And, uh, you know, people can check out the movie at thebubblefilms.com. As I mentioned before, if you join the street team, you can actually watch it now. Um, but even if you don't want to do that, we have like the raw footage of a bunch of our interviews on our website and uh, podcasts that we've done with you and with other people. So there's a lot of content out there that we're excited to get out to people. Um, and I'm looking forward to doing screenings at colleges and um, with organizations. We've, as I mentioned before, we've done a lot of test screenings, but I'm excited to just get out there and reach the general public with this. Uh, as long as the colleges will keep having me. Yeah, I mean, that's a huge problem now with freedom of speech, and they don't even like, you know, a lot of colleges now, unfortunately, don't like libertarians or conservatives even speaking there, and they're charging them, like, security fees. Some some of them, some speakers are getting charged, like, $30,000 or more security fee. It's got, got getting ridiculous, Jimmy. Yeah, I, I won't say what college it was, but there was a prof economics professor uh, that told me he wouldn't let his school... Uh, uh, do a screening there because we didn't have any black people in our movie. And it's funny because the first person I pitched even before, uh, Thomas Woods, uh, was Thomas Sowell. And, uh, he, he thought it was an excellent project, but, uh, at his age, he really couldn't take on something of that magnitude. But it's interesting because it kind of shows like when I first started this project, although I wasn't like a full out monetarist, uh, I just was uneducated about the Federal Reserve and the monetary system. I really uh, had more of a Milton Friedman and the Free to Choose documentary series, like had had a huge influence on me in his book, um, Free to Choose. So it's interesting that I kind of started as uh, more of a, a, a Republican. Uh, and, you know, I would say I've uh, become a full-fledged uh, voluntarist or anarchist, however you want to describe it. Um, but it's been quite the process. So I'm excited to hear people's uh, comments on the movie and uh, they can email me at Jimmy at let us disagree dot com uh, or contact us through our website. And then our social media is uh, Facebook dot com slash the bubble film. Same for Twitter. And then uh, I'm Jim Morrison film on both as well. Well, I'm excited to finish the rest of the film after we're done with this interview. I, I think I really have to compliment you. You showed passion and true grit persevering through all the adversity and you've told me we're not going to you know talk about all the details of it but it's been very difficult for you and not giving up so to actually see this project finish you've overcome a lot of obstacles to get the documentary to the finish line and uh, uh hopefully our listeners will go out and purchase the film and hopefully they'll like it and hopefully they'll share it with friends and family because um if more people don't wake up the people in power are going to get away with this without ron paul who's you know probably the the best person for the liberty movement without him getting that one-time partial audit of the federal reserve we wouldn't have even known that they printed uh basically gave out interest-free loans bailouts in the form of currency swaps tens of trillions uh i think over 20 trillion dollars it was over 16 trillion and then the estimates got changed uh you know to foreign governments foreign central banks and foreign corporations and it's you know the american taxpayer the person whose savings got devalued that's not fair. We didn't get to vote on it. So they thought they were doing yeah. it in our best interest, and, you know, we didn't have a say in it. Yeah, that's right. And I hope that people continue listening uh, to your show. Uh, I've been a huge fan over the years, and it's been a great resource for me. Um, and I think that what YouTube has done uh, in cutting uh, your access to people is complete bullshit. And I, I really hope that some of these alternative uh, platforms are able to – become good enough and get a big enough market that we can just not preach to the choir on alternative sites and uh, actually be able to influence the general public uh, without having to rely on YouTube because it's Thank just you. ridiculous. Thank yeah. you, man. I, re I really appreciate that. I was actually podcasting before podcasting was cool. So now everyone's yeah, right, like podcasting. Right, you were. Yeah, yeah, I was doing it before because, you know, I would write all these long in depth investment articles on like the dollar index was flawed in 2010 and 11 when I was waking up and, and learning about Austrian school economics and reading all these investment books. And I would only get like maybe a couple hundred people at most sometimes to read these articles. And some of them were lengthy and a lot of citations, but, 
you know, just being able to speak and, and present my content this way, I think it's more efficient and a lot more people can listen to it and appreciate it that way. And, um, you know, what you, what YouTube has done is just, it's deplorable, <laughs> but yeah. it's, these, these big technology companies are censorship monopolies. And, you know, these are, these are rich, rich Democrats. So, you know, they, some of them may be libertarian, maybe Peter Thiel was at one point. I'm not sure if he still is, but you know, the majority of these Silicon Valley types, man, they don't, they don't want free speech anymore. I, I was actually supposed to interview Peter for the documentary. Um, and, uh, I, drove to dc and then we weren't able to connect uh but i would say that kind of worked out i've been uh disappointed in some of the directions he's taken on security issues to say the least <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll have to see that for the next interview so uh good luck good luck on your tour and um you know if it's already won some award i wish it would win your documentary would win some awards for the mainstream financial media but unfortunately this they just have a certain mindset and a way they feel they don't want to rehash the things about 2008 unless it's praising ben bernanke uh they don't want to talk about how the austrian school was right and in a lot of cases they almost definitely don't want to say anything positive about gold yeah that's true and to be honest like getting to screen the documentary at Mises university after all these years was like the most validating thing I ever could have had, you know? So I'm, I'm very thankful. And, uh, it's easy to say like, Oh, I only am reaching hundreds of people with a video or something like that. Uh, when a podcast or whatever doesn't get a lot of views or something like that. Uh, but really if you compare that to like before when people had to go out and sit in a room with people, like you're reaching far more people than, uh, most people throughout history. And, uh, you know, people like Joe Rogan, uh, Joe Rogan reaches over 100 million uh, views uh, or listens uh, per month. And so that's over a billion people. He, well, not people, but a billion listens that he's getting per year, uh, which is pretty fascinating when you compare that to the mainstream media. So things are definitely changing, and uh, it's an exciting time. Yeah, he's a he's a big time influencer. He's been podcasting, I think, longer than me. Hopefully, hopefully my listeners think I've gotten better in the eight years I've been doing this. Um, <laughs> it was not it was not yeah. always easy trying to get better. But I, I want to thank you again for your time, Jimmy. And um, I'll put links for people to go look at the preview for the film, the uh, the uncut scenes, like you said, and also to purchase the film. All right. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you taking the time. Please like this video, share it with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe to the Wall Street for Main Street YouTube channel if you have not already done so. Thanks for helping Wall Street for Main Street pass the 20,000 YouTube channel subscriber milestone despite YouTube censorship. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to 30,000 or even 40,000 YouTube channel subscribers quickly if YouTube doesn't shut down this channel. If YouTube does shut down this channel, Remember to also sign up for the Wall Street for Main Street email list that's on the wallstreetformainstreet.com website and will tell you where the videos are going to be uploaded instead of YouTube. Also, if you really like the content and you decide that you want to give a one-time donation, you can go to the wallstreetformainstreet.com website where there's different options for you to do so. Or you can become a Patreon contributor. Thanks for listening and I look forward to providing my loyal listeners with some of the best information analysis, and financial education available out there, free or paid, as I work to grow the podcast and also get my educational technology company funded.